Good day, everyone, and welcome to our Ocean Exploration Day discussion with deep sea explorers Don Walsh and Don Wright. My name is Katie Croft Bell, and I'm the founder and president of the Ocean Discovery League, which is declared today the first ever Ocean Exploration Day. We chose January 23rd in honor of the anniversary of the first deep dive to the Mariana Trench, which was made by Don Walsh and Jacques Picard on this day in 1960. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I do want to pause to honor one important person who made that historic dive possible, John Michelle, who unfortunately passed away just over a month ago. John was a friend and mentor of my father for many years, and he was chief of the boat for the historic Trieste mission. So in preparation for this, I have been reading this book, Opening the Great Depths. And in it, um, just last year, John wrote me a note. Hi, Katie. I've known your father, Jim, for half a lifetime. I was also chief of the boat, Trieste. This guy, referring to Don Walsh, was my boss, but I was the first man as crew of the scaff. Also, without my repairs, there would not have been the deep dive. If you were ever offered the chance to make it to the Hadel Deep, it would be worth the trip, as you would see some unusual critters. Bon chance, John Michelle. And then we're fortunate today to have two people who thought it would be worth the trip. Um, Don Walsh, Walsh and Don Wright. We have Don and Don, so I'll use their last names a lot <laughs> today. Um, the first of which um, is Dr. Don Walsh, who was John's boss. And also, that's the reason why he's here today, along with Jacques Picard, was one of two people to make that first deep dive in the bath scaff Trieste. Bathy for deep and scaff for ship, which was essentially a giant underwater balloon that took them 35,800 feet or nearly 11,000 meters into Challenger Deep, the deepest point in the ocean. Two of them were in the sphere at the bottom of the craft as they made the eight and a half hour long journey down and back. Now, following this historic dive, Don had a distinguished naval career and became a physical oceanographer, one of the first to use remote sensing for his research. He spent a lifetime associated with ocean science, engineering, and marine policy. Now, our second speaker has made history. This is us. This is Don Walsh, sorry. Our second speaker has made history not once, but twice in deep sea exploration. Dr. Don Wright, who you can see on the left here, was the first African-American female to dive to the ocean floor in the deep submersible Alvin. And just about six months ago, became the first black person of any nationality or gender to dive to Jallinger Deep in the deep submergence vehicle, a limiting factor. She was able to see a whole lot more than Don Walsh did, and she successfully operated a side scan sonar at full ocean depth, which had never been done before. Don is a specialist in marine geology and geography and is the chief scientist of ESRI. Her work has had a significant impact on the use of GIS technology for a variety of seafloor mapping, environmental conservation, and terrestrial mapping projects in addition to her work in the marine environment. So please join me in welcoming Don Walsh and Don Wright today to discuss the past, present, and future of deep sea exploration. Now, first, I'd love to hear about your experiences in Challenger Deep. And since Don Walsh was there, preceding Don Wright by over 60 years, um, let's start with you. You, me? Yes, you. Ah, okay. I was looking at all these people uh, on the screen here, and I'm trying to find myself. Maybe one of the ladies here has a, a mirror. I can. No, that's we okay. can see you. You're looking good, Don. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I dimly recall about um, what have been 70, 63 years ago. Um, Jacques Picard and I. Uh, made a nine hour dive to the deepest place in the ocean. So we were the first humans ever to visit that place. And th that's back in the prehistoric times, really. Uh, we, uh, for example, we didn't exactly know where the Challenger Deep was or how deep it was. Why did we know where it was? Well, 
we didn't have uh, the uh, satellite navigation systems in those days. We had that precision. <laughs> there was something in those days called LORAN, which was uh, a um, radio kind of signal that uh, helped you navigate. But where the navigation was particularly bad is what we call a, a, a extension line from the radio station. And that, um, what your navigation there was really inaccurate. We were right on one of those lines. So we don't know where we were. And uh, we didn't have the depth sounding, the electronic equipment to actually measure how deep the ocean was at that point. Um, but by using the, uh, the, the transponder or transducer, I mean, to receive the, uh, the uh, energy put into the ocean, we could actually, by using blocks of TNT, one pound blocks, we just put uh, the fuse in, light it up, throw it in the water. And uh, when you got the bang, of course, that's you start the stopwatch. And the return echo from that explosion could be heard on the ship's fathometer. While the fathometer could not measure water depth much beyond 300 feet, the, the actual microphone, if you were a listening device, could hear that energy because a pound of TNT uh, it puts a lot of energy in the ocean. So uh, how do we map out Challenger Deep to figure out where we were and what, where to put the bathyscaphe? We just said, you know, 12 seconds is deeper than eight seconds. And we went back and forth for about two days blowing up the ocean and finally mapped out an area about seven miles long and a mile wide. And when the bathyscap came out uh, behind the tugboat from Guam, about 200 miles, uh, we said, put it right there. And uh, then we unhooked the towing wire from the tugboat, jumped aboard the bathyscap, and off we went. The dive took nine hours, about um, five hours and some change going down. We stayed on the bottom 20 minutes, and then we came back up in about three hours. And of course, uh, as some of you may know, uh, in 2020, and actually Father's Day in 2020, my son, Kelly, uh, made that same dive with Victor Vescovo, a highly advanced man submersible. Um, and uh, they actually got deeper and stayed longer than I did. So my, my son's really got the bragging rights. It was kind of a nice Father's Day uh, gift. Uh, and uh, when we landed on the bottom, we didn't see anything. I guess we were blind because the bottom sediments there is a diatomaceous ooze, which is a fancy word for very fine particles, which you'd not encountered in our earlier dives in the deep ocean. And um, it just stirred up and, and stayed in suspension in front of our window. So it was like somebody painted the viewport with white paint. We couldn't see how we were blind. And in fact, the, uh, it wasn't until 20 years later that the first pictures were ever made uh, in the bottom of the Challenger Deep, and that was a, with a Japanese um, unmanned submersible, and they could park it on the seafloor. We knew that there was this, this always current all the way down the bottom of the ocean. We knew if we waited long enough, that cloud would move off. But we couldn't wait that long because we had to get the sub back up to the surface and hook up the towing wire to the seagoing tug. And you didn't want to do that in the dark. Somebody's going to lose a hand. So we uh, managed to, we were going to reserve two hours of daylight at the end of the day to hook it back up. So we were kind of bookended, if you will, because when the tugboat came out from Guam, I wanted to allow two hours to unhook the tow and do the free dive checks. And then uh, at the end of the day, as I said, we wanted two hours of daylight to resume the tow. So whatever was left over between those two bookends was the length of dive, which is roughly nine hours. So that was about it. We, uh, uh, we When we came back to the surface, this might be of interest, uh, we're sitting on top of the bathyscap, sort of waiting to be picked up, taken back to our mothership. And um, so Jacques Picard and I were wondering, we're kind of talking about how long it would be till the next uh, people came out there and do the exploration. Because we were just testing out the machine to make sure it could make the ultimate depth. I mean, it was purchased by our Navy as a research platform. And is it effective? Is it safe? Is it uh, reliable? And we're like uh, test pilots for an airplane. We're neither one of us is a scientist. We we're both engineers. Okay, so we get back to the surface and we're talking about this. How long? I mean, so we get some real scientists out here and do some useful work. And we finally agreed that our most conservative estimate would be two years, close half a century. And Jim Cameron then was 52 years after I made my dive. 
Jim Cameron went out with his submarine. I was on that expedition, of course. I didn't dive in his sub because it was a one person sub. So that was disappointing. People say, well, you sorry that somebody broke your record? And I said, we weren't making records. We're trying to prove out a platform for oceanographers. And record breaking was, I guess, by per force. You go to the deepest place in the ocean and you're first, you make a record. I don't know. But um, 52 years later, that took to, and, and Jim really didn't do that much science. It was a very, um, very active dive, but uh, the one person sub, sometimes it's difficult to do much except fly and keep out of trouble. And it really wasn't until Victor Vescovo, seven years after Jim made his dive, that we had somebody that really went down to do useful work. And of course, Don can tell you about that and how it turned out to be, it has turned out to be a very practical and productive uh, deep ocean exploring tool platform for science, something we didn't do much of in the early days. Over to you, Don. Thank you, Don. Uh, I'm just stunned by our gathering here uh, and really appreciate uh, Katie's uh, introduction and, and also the ties uh, to her own father. I mean, I, I can't get enough of this uh, ocean history and uh, hearing uh, Don's account, there, there's so many things that are different, of course, and uh, also warm greetings uh, to Kelly, uh, your son, who's had the, the same experience that I've had in Victor Vescovo's limiting factor. And I'm wearing the um, Caladan Oceanic uh, shirt, expedition shirt uh, that, that we all got. Uh, I, I'm struck, it's like, where to start here? Uh, when uh, when Don was uh, talking about going uh, to Challenger Deep for the very first time, and then all the amount of time that it took for for the next person, James Cameron, to get there, there was a little thing called uh, the space program that intervened, and perhaps uh, that that was part of the delay. Because uh, as a young person, you know, I was born the year after Don went to Challenger Deep. And I was eight years old when Apollo 11 went to the moon, and that captured the imagination of so many of us uh, to, to go into space. But one of the things that was really uh, powerful for me was as I saw those men go into space, that made me even more determined to go uh, and follow in, in Don's and others' footsteps to go to the ocean and explore the ocean. We can get into a whole lot of discussions about uh, the, the will, the political will of our governments and the amount of funding. Uh, Don and I spent some time together on the National Academy of Sciences uh, Ocean Studies Board, which discussed the, those many uh, issues. But I'll just say, uh, to, to get to my own dive experience, really interesting because our dive was about 10 and a half hours long. And uh, we also took four hours uh, to get to the bottom. One of the things that is interesting about Challenger Deep is that there are three depressions within Challenger Deep, the Eastern Pool uh, where the records are, are set. And I believe that's, uh, that's where Don and, and Jacques uh, first touched down. And then Kelly returned there uh, as the, the Father's Day gift for, for dad in that Eastern pool, that's where the records are set. Uh, but there's also this central pool and the Western pool, not quite as deep as the Eastern pool. Uh, Victor Vescova and I decided to go to the Western pool and we did have scientific objectives. So many people uh, had not, uh, of, the, of the many people now who've been to Challenger Deep, not as many of us have been uh, to the central or Western pools. And so we decided to go to a place uh, that was among the least visited. So, you know, since we're now at the stage where, you know, we can pick and choose these places and we're, we're sending people down there, uh, let's, let's go to, to this spot. Uh, and so uh, our, our uh, maximum depth was 10,919 uh, meters into the Western Pool, four hour descent, uh, around three hours on the bottom, very different from the 20 minutes on the bottom. Uh, because of, of course, the advancements uh, in the technology and the remarkable submersible that 
the limiting factor is, we had enough time to do uh, some surveying uh, on the bottom with this submersible. You know, as Kelly uh, can also tell you, the limiting factor in its design, uh, only two people, uh, different from James uh, Cameron's design, certainly, but it's designed to get to the bottom as quickly as possible to, to make observations, to even take samples, and then to get back up as quickly as possible. But we did something a little different. We, we put an instrument on the bottom uh, of the submersible, a side scan sonar, so that we could experiment uh, with an instrument for doing very high resolution uh, surveying with, with that instrument. And we wanted to just ensure that the instrument could withstand the maximum pressure, the 16,000 pounds per square inch pressure uh, at Challenger Deep and collect data, give us uh, reflectivity of the seafloor, give us a, an acoustic picture uh, of the seafloor. That same instrument uh, actually played a role in the discovery of the Samuel B. Roberts with the limiting factor uh, a month earlier. So that this, the Roberts uh, lies at the bottom of the Philippine Sea as the world's deepest shipwreck. And then that same instrument uh, as operated by Deep Ocean Search, I should say, which is a company out of France and Mauritius, uh, they had a role in discovering uh, the endurance, uh, Shackleton's endurance uh, earlier. So, so that's where we're going now in terms of not only visiting the seafloor in high resolution, but imaging down there at these deepest spots uh, uh, parts of the of the planet. Uh, and I don't want to go too too long here because we have so many fantastic questions, but uh, another huge difference uh, between the, the Trieste dive and and mine was that we had robots with us. We had landers. and uh, the landers are robots that have uh, that give us additional scientific capability as well as helping us to know exactly where we are on the bottom. Uh, Don talked about the, the huge difficulties in just knowing where you are. And I can't even imagine throwing TNT overboard to generate acoustic waves to navigate by or to, uh, to map by. But thank goodness we don't have to do that anymore. We, we had uh, a series of acoustic modems. You know, you think about a modem with your computer we had a modem on the limiting factor, which pinged off of the modem that was on one of the landers. And so we could uh, dead reckon based on the ultimate position uh, of the lander. And we, we knew we, we pretty much had a great idea of where the lander was because the ship uh, was able to track the lander on its way down to, the, to Challenger Deep and then a survey in uh, its latitude, longitude, and depth. So we so we had that as a, as an almost an absolute position to steer by, so to speak. Then there was another lander uh, that we sent to Challenger Deep, not as deep, but it was it, it rested at around eight thousand meters depth, so that we could capture uh, imagery of fish, uh, and and there is a whole uh, research program. Uh, that is going on the, the Hadal uh, biology now as uh, our marine biology colleagues are discovering all of these amazing creatures that live uh, in these trenches. So uh, the lander that was with us down in the Western Pool and the lander that was a little higher up, both of those landers captured really valuable video footage. Uh, they were also able to capture some critters uh, for sampling. And uh, so, so that, that's a huge difference now where a submersible does not, it, we, are, we are not alone from, from that standpoint and we have this other technology that can go with us. Uh, there's so many other things uh, to say about a dive like this. We also had the ability of course to do the styrofoam cups. So, uh, Here's uh, one cup at the start, and here it is at the end uh, at uh, Challenger Deep uh, from the limiting factor submersible. So, so that's always fun too. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity to, to be part of this.
Thank you both for the wonderful um, introduction to your experiences. Don Wright, I just have a super quick question. How maneuverable is um, the limiting factor? Are you able to get around down there or is it more like Trieste where you just go down and, and go no, straight? No, uh, the limiting factor uh, has a, a series of thrusters on either side, so it can go in all directions. So uh, of course, up and down, uh, forward, backward, uh, it is uh, really good at going sideways because of its design. Uh, and it worked pretty good as a mow the lawn kind of survey tool that, that we know mm -hmm. when we're doing seafloor surveys. We did have to put the side scan sonar on one side of the submersible. And so when we were doing, when we were testing the instrument, uh, Victor turned off the thrusters uh, on that side so as not to uh, interfere with the data that we were trying to collect. But it is uh, fully, fully maneuverable. Uh, I, having been in Alvin and Pisces, uh, I, I would say that it it can it can do a, a very good job with uh, sampling and a little bit of surveying as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, we've got several great questions coming in the chat. If you have any questions, please put them in there, and we'll spend the next half an hour um, doing Q and A with with Don and Don. Um, so Don Walsh. A question from Elva Escobar. In your point of view, what was the major challenge in the first exploration of the Challenger Deep? Well, the major challenge was um, to be able to do it. Uh, I'm not being precious, uh, but uh, when you're doing something for the first time, you, you, you know, you try and eliminate all the variables as many as you can. And that's why we actually did increasingly deeper test dives for about six months at Guam. We started out in the harbor, uh, Guam at 80 feet. We worked our way out into the ocean so that in November of 1959, we had made a dive to 16,000 feet. And then we came back in for maintenance and such. And then January 1960, we went to 24,000 feet. And then 10 days later, went to the full ocean depth, 800, 10,812 meters, I believe. So, uh, and, and by doing these progressive test dives, it's like, I guess it's an analog to be a new airplane. You design it, you try and think of everything that could go wrong and, and anticipate it or fix it in advance, but not until you actually use it, do you know what's gonna happen uh, exactly. So we got used to its moods, the noises, all kinds of interesting noises, the thing would groan and crack and so on. And things that would scare you a tad, except that as we're making progressive dives, we figured out what it was, the moods of, I know I'm being anthropomorphic, but the moods of the device. And uh, so by the time of the deepest dive, we had eliminated as many of the variables as we could so that, um, what if things happen, uh, it got your attention right away because that's something we hadn't heard or experienced before. And uh, that that was uh, a lot of hard work because in those days, well, it's like the early days of aviation, coming back to that again, there were like only two airplanes in the world. There's only one other bathyscap, deep diving man, mm -hmm. uh, submersible, and that was the French bathyscap, uh, FNRS-3, which was based out of Toulon in France, also designed by Picard. Uh, Trieste was the next bathyscap after that one. So we could actually, you know, book a table for 10 people in a restaurant. You'd have all the world's experience in bathyscapery uh, right around that table. And, and so uh, you couldn't buy stuff. You couldn't just get a catalog from a vendor and gee, I need some uh, outside lights that are particularly this brightness and and withstand eight tons per square inch pressure. You had to design it and have somebody make it or make it ourselves. We mentioned John Michel earlier. That was the magic of what he did for us. Uh, he, uh, John was the kind of person where he wrote down what you wanted on a three by five card and then just slipped it under the door to his shop. And then lo and behold, 10 days later or so, the door had opened and out come this device. So it was, we had to make, designed to make everything we needed, necessity mm -hmm. being mother of invention, the old saying. 
So there's a whole, a whole lot of pioneering going on. By the time you get to Victor, uh, there have been, well, I can certainly say several hundred man submersibles throughout the world and they built in the 60s and the 70s. Not all of this depth capability, but basically the operational ideas of these things it is about the same. You know, they're flying underwater flying machines. Uh, the, the bathyscap is basically an underwater balloon. And so the principle is very safe, but the execution, operational execution, is a bit more complex. So we were, as I say, we were really test pilots. Uh, science was not our goal. We did some science, but our goal was to deliver to the scientific community a safe, productive, and reliable platform to be used for science and, uh, uh, and not to do science ourselves. Well, we had scientific staff in our group, but that wasn't primary job. Mm -hmm. it, I guess you might call it was an engineering program. Yeah. Yeah. Most could definitely. I could I quickly uh, comment? Uh, I'm absolutely. Quickly. Uh, I'm I'm putting in the chat uh, the uh, documentary of, about the limiting factor, which surely uh, drew upon uh, the. Uh, all of the firsts and all of the knowledge uh, from from the Trieste experience, and also talks about Triton submarines, which which built that craft, and it's it's a wonderful uh, journey uh, in terms of of how uh, our technology in this area is still moving forward, and the idea of uh, not just a, a test pilot situation as Don and and Jacques Picard were. We're providing for us, but the idea now of repeatable uh, return visits with the same vehicle. So moving now to the era of uh, these craft being like a like the space shuttle, and so uh, James Cameron's dive was also extremely uh, valuable for this. And I and I think that that James Cameron wanted his craft to be uh, to be able to return to Challenger Deep. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I was really amazed at with working with uh, Victor uh, and his team, and again, Kelly saw this as well, is that they now uh, have, the limiting factor is a space shuttle to, to Challenger Deep and to all of the other deepest places in the ocean, and the technology has gotten that far. It's that safe. That's incredible. And it's a great um, segue, actually, to, to another good question about expectations for the dive. Um, Don, you were obviously the first person there. What did you expect? And did it exceed your expectations? I know you couldn't see a whole lot. Um, but then Don Wright, there had been 20 something dives by the time you went down. So you could be um, you know, more prepared, you had inst particular instruments you were planning on testing while you were down there. You know, how did your experience compare to the expectations that you had? Me first? Sure. Okay. I had no expectations. Short answer. Uh, I know what our goal was. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to some place no one's ever been, yeah, you can kind of synthesize what it should be. That's science fiction, isn't it? imagine things and, and right. I stay close to reality. That is the engineering arts, material sciences, all the things you need to keep together to make a machine to do that work. But um, so our, our expectation was, if I'm too precious, success. We had a small team of 14 people, half military, uh, uh, uniform military, and half uh, military civilian. And we work seven days a week. Uh, we'd sneak up on the job in the dark and go home in the dark. It was long days. So our expectation was success. And uh, we weren't always so sure of that. A mm -hmm. lot of stuff went wrong. Wheels come off. And we don't have enough time to get into any of those details. But um, because we had worked so hard on the variables, um, we were able to deal with the unexpected fairly easily without uh, too much uh, stirring around and shouting and so on. Um, I, in, in our case, I, I call it the skill luck ratio. Uh, you hope skill is more than 50% uh, and the balance you hope for good luck. So we had a little of each. So expectation would be, uh, I think that would have to come along after somebody's done this a few times. Mm -hmm. 
So Dawn really can deal better with expectations. And, and of course, with her previous experience with Alvin, which is arguably the most uh, proficient uh, uh, man submersible ever employed for science. It's 50 years old now, but it's been reborn, I think four or five times over those 50 years. It's mm -hmm. just qualified for a depth 6,500 feet, which by the way is, I mean, the viewers may not know this, if you get to 6,000 meters, you can look at 98% of the seafloor. Only 2% is deeper than that. It's all the trenches at 2%. Very important. I'm not saying it's not important, but that's why you saw, I think, at least five or six submersibles in the world uh, all clustered around that depth capability of 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters, because it's a pretty good trade off as if you're an engineer, you're getting kind of 98% of something for about half the cost. Because at, at 20,000 feet, you, well, it's not half of 40,000 feet, but you get the idea uh, that if you're paying for engineering cost of building something, that's a nice trade-off, but it doesn't do the job for the uh, hadal depths, the trenches. So um, there's that. Uh, and uh, so a lot, of, a lot of experience now out there, as I was saying earlier, and uh, Victor was able to capture the, the this whole, the essence of all that experience and, and produce a system that uh, is reliable, repeatable, and safe. And uh, when I, I was out with him when he made his first dive to Challenger Deep, that was in 2019. And uh, I was there on deck when he came up from his first dive. And they made three dives to Challenger Deep in, I think, four days. And it's just un, undreamt in my time, and certainly <laughs> Jim Cameron. That we can have that like 50 employee. years to do three dives the first time around. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and it's a go anywhere in the world. I mean, you can take a yeah. world map, put it on the wall and throw a dart at it. And uh, as long as you hit the ocean, uh, that's a place you can go. Because they have a mothership, it's a system. You carry the vehicle to the site. We didn't have that. I got a lot of trouble uh, when the, uh, the uh, one capsule was lost. And uh, it was off of uh, Florida. And uh, they asked me to go get it. I couldn't do it because the Trieste could dive to any place in the world ocean. We just couldn't get it to the dive site. You have to tow it. Well, if you tow it more than a few miles, there's not going to be anything left of it but a, a piece of cable. And it's been ripped off the end of it because it was very fragile. And now it's with Victor's system, you can go anywhere in the world. And he has. Uh, and and we got a pretty reliable system. Over to you, Don. Yes, uh, Don. In yeah. terms of uh, expectations, my gosh, uh, I I may have gone with Victor on his last dive to Challenger Deep for for at least for quite some time. So I was with Victor on his fifteenth dive to Challenger Deep, and by then the expectations were really high in terms of launching and recovering the sub. It was uh, the the submersible support team. Uh, on the pressure drop, uh, someone described their their movements and their efficiency like a ballet, yeah. uh, like mm -hmm. an absey ballet. They were so good at everything. Uh, everything went smoothly. Uh, the Alvin crew is like that as well. When you when you see the launch or or you're involved in the launch of Alvin, and uh, the way the swimmers, everything is so seamless and so smooth. So you don't you don't worry about anything because you know you're in the best of hands. Uh, so many people have asked me if I was afraid uh, uh, of going down, not, not at all, especially when you, you can just focus uh, on, the, on the science and you know that you've got this reliable vehicle uh, to, to take you there. Uh, and, and same with that, we are so, so, all of us are so excited about Alvin getting to the 6,500, uh, to, that, to that certification. I have a Lego model here at home of the Shinkai 6500, and I've been waiting for Alvin to get there. So now I can build a Lego of the full ocean depth, the uh, near full ocean depth Alvin. And it is amazing. The 90, you, uh, thank you so much, Don, for, for mentioning that. 98% you can get to most, Alvin can get to most of, of the ocean now. In, in terms of expectations upon the reaching the bottom, uh, one of the things now for those of us who are who are scientists in the, the 20th and 21st centuries that all of this video footage, uh, I have relied my entire career on 
the video footage provided by Woods Hole, uh, first with uh, the uh, Argo, uh, the uh, Bob Ballard's Argo sled, and mm -hmm. with, uh, with Alvin, uh, and all of the wonderful Deep Submergence Labs instruments. So you, and then I've, I, in preparation for Challenger Deep, I've watched so much footage coming from from Victor uh, and his team mainly to prepare for what we were going to see. So there, there wasn't uh, that much of a surprise there. And even in terms of the biology, I know you have a lot of biology questions in the chat, the little amphipods, uh, the sea pig holothurans, uh, the anemones, they were there just like uh, in the video footage. But what we did not expect was as soon as we hit bottom, we saw the infamous beer bottle that a lot of you have heard about. That is the first thing, the very first thing that we saw immediately upon touching the bottom. So Victor and I were completely blown away and disappointed and uh, uh, upset about that. So, so that was a surprise. And um, it, it's an indication of the extent the reach of human activity even to challenger deep i don't know don it was so hard for for you to see on your dive but uh i've been uh, so upset by so many deep sea dives where we have seen trash uh on, on the seafloor and scientific trash there's a place uh in the western pool that victor will no longer go to because there's so much uh, dangerous umbilicals or cabling uh, left behind there that it's a hazard. So he just will not go there, regardless of what the objectives might be. It's just too dangerous. So that's another error that we have moved into. Thanks, Don and Don. Uh, we've got tons of great questions. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to all of them, but we will try. Um, first, I want to switch gears a little bit, though, um, because I was having a discussion today, and Don Wright, I know you saw this earlier today with um, Angela Villa Gomez from the Center of, of American Progress about the fact that no one from the Mariana Islands has been to the Mariana Trench. You know, these tools that make it possible to go to the deep sea are still very expensive. They're still very exclusive. It's still only the richest organizations and individuals and countries who have access to these kinds of tools. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on how we can make deep sea exploration more equitable um, and in many ways empower the sovereignty of, of people to be able to do it for themselves without having to rely on perhaps, you know, the invitation or the generosity of somebody who's coming into someone else's waters to be able to do this kind of work. And I know you've seen change over the last 60 years. It's changing, um, but how can we how can we do better? Mm -hmm. did, did you want me to to start, uh, Katie? I, either of you. Well, I always want to defer to Don. So over to you, Don. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I have a little different take on that. Um, and Don knows this as well as I do. Those seats are precious on these submersibles. It's not like a city bus where you just get the next one if the one you want to get on is full. I have turned down dives in Alvin at least three times because I can't add, put anything on the table. I mean, I, I have a doctorate in oceanography. I got it 50 years ago. I'm not a practicing oceanographer. I already have time to keep up with the field. And for me to get in there and take up a seat of a scientist and and be unproductive by nature uh, is unfair. And I've always turned down these dives because uh, I don't think I should be taking up a dive, uh, a seat, if you will, from someone who's actually going to produce knowledge for the benefit of mankind. Um, I had bragging rights, of course. I, I did this. And I guess Woods Hole felt good about having a, an artifact, a historical artifact like me on board. But I just don't believe in it. I know how hard won that space is mm -hmm. and should be filled by proper scientists. So the idea of maybe going to the Marianas and finding somebody to, to uh, dive in this reversible is um, they have to be, number one, have to be qualified. I don't care if you're a Romanian or uh, Inuit from 
you know, Canada, North, uh, they might be qualified to have that position. And it goes without saying that um, you're not going to find, by and large, that kind of person in sort of third world countries. I'm not saying Guam is third world, but you get the point. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of working PhD because they're not going to be in Guam if they're highly trained because they don't have the ancillary equipment, the laboratories, the, the uh, oceanograph sea going oceanographic ships and all of that. I guess, you know, that may sound a little uh, uh, rank, uh, you know, rank conscious. That you're not good enough to get here. I hope you take my point that you want whoever's sitting in that seat doing science better be highly qualified and specialist in their field. Otherwise, you're wasting a lot of time and money, time and treasure to, uh, to get something that's more of a feature news story than uh, creating knowledge. Because creating knowledge for mankind, I don't care if you're you know, fourth world country, it's for our benefit of everybody in the world. And, uh, and so that kind of symbolism makes me a little uncomfortable. Symbolically, we put somebody in the seat and they can say, I dove to blah, blah, but did you create any knowledge? It's the difference between exploration and adventuring. Adventuring is more of an internal exploration. You go do things, I mean, some guy that wants to take a paddleboard from San Francisco Bay to Tokyo Bay, God bless them. You know, it takes a certain mental toughness and physical toughness to do that. They're not creating knowledge for you and me. They're taking, and, and, and venturing is legitimate. I'm not against it. Exploration is when you, when you, it's curiosity acted upon. And so there's a whole different mindset there. You are creating knowledge for the benefit of everybody in the world. So that's my take on it. I may be wrong, but personally, I don't subscribe to uh, just getting bragging rights. Sure, and yeah, I'm not talking about tokenism, um, but we, we um, Ocean Discovery League actually did a study in the last year and a half that showed that there was more um, expertise in deep sea exploration and research than there were access to the tools and technologies needed to actually do the exploration and research in many countries around the world, some that perhaps you might not expect. Um, so I guess the question is, how can we make tools? And maybe it's not, you know, the deep submersible, the one that exists, maybe it's other types of tools um, that can go to the deep sea. Um, how can we make those kinds of tools accessible, available, and perhaps increase the human capacity in places that don't have it yet so that people there can explore for themselves? Well, it, Don? It, it may be heresy, but uh, I do believe the heavy lifting in the future is going to be done by unmanned systems. I mean, um, autonomous underwater vehicles are getting so smart, right? the AI, mm -hmm. all the new sciences that are converted to engineering know-how and capability going to these vehicles to do amazing things. Now, there's always going to be room for a person. Um, I mean, we're interested in what people do. Look at People Magazine. It's been around, what, for a half century. All you're reading there is what other people are doing. So there's that essential human curiosity about what other people do. So I, there's always going to be room for uh, people in vehicles. But whether the number of vehicles will match the demand, that's a different question. And, and so a lot of those people are going to be involved in the far less costly and probably equally as productive unmanned systems. That's my take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Don Wright, would you like to speak to? Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, I, I'm so glad you, <laughs> you brought this up. Uh, uh, Katie, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I saw that on Twitter. And I, I had a, uh, a chat with, with Angelo and with the Friends of the Mariana Trench before going on my dive. Mm -hmm. uh, because another thing that is in the works is to declare uh, the northern part of the Mariana Trench as a U.S. National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, and so uh, I loved your response to him, uh, which was absolutely someone from the uh, Mariana Islands should go to Challenger Deep. It's interesting, though, because I, I know I don't know what happened with prior dives to Challenger Deep with Caladan Oceanic, but Victor uh, went out of his his way. At my assumptions that he always does to get the proper permissions for diving in Challenger Deep. 
at, for each series of dives. And uh, the understanding is that Challenger Deep, that part of the Mariana Trench is actually within the Federated States of Micronesia territory. It belongs to Challenger Deep belongs to uh, FSM, as we call it, Federated States of Micronesia, which is why mm -hmm. Victor went to great lengths to send Nicole Yamase to make sure that she got a seat to go to Challenger Deep within her own territorial waters. Uh, and, and Nicole is a newly minted PhD uh, in marine biology. Uh, so to Don's point, uh, the, the idea is to send uh, uh, scientists uh, to these places. These are very, very precious seats. Uh, I, I agree with Don that the uh, autonomous uh, and what, what Ocean Discovery League is doing uh, with, with your ROVs, uh, that capacity building uh, for, for all places, uh, especially for the, the smaller countries, extremely important. But I want to make a, uh, I know we're running out of time, but we don't, uh, on, on my uh, Challenger deep dive, I don't get as much opportunity to talk about the two dives that took place after mine. They went to the Yap Trench and to the Palau Trench. And the person who got the seat on the Yap Trench dive, he and Victor became the first two human beings to go to the Yap Trench. Cesario Sawalier took that, um, that dive. His father is Papa Mao, uh, who is basically the, uh, the author of uh, Polynesian, uh, Micronesian and, and Polynesian voyaging, teaching uh, indigenous people about that heritage. And Victor wanted to show Cesario what it's like to navigate uh, in the bottom of his own trench, the Yap Trench, as, mm -hmm. uh, as compared to surface navigation with the stars. And it was a very, very meaningful dive. Uh, Cesario will use that in his instruction, his teaching. He reaches out to uh, hundreds, uh, thousands uh, of, of indigenous uh, Micronesians through his teaching uh, with Micronesian voyaging. And then to the Palau Trench, uh, Victor ensured that former president of the Republic of Palau, Tommy Remengasau, uh, went to Palau Trent, to the Palau Trench. He has, uh, boy, if you don't know about uh, Tommy Remengasau Jr., please look him up because he is a shining lighthouse for ocean conservation for the entire world. And Palau is a lighthouse for uh, conservation and ocean policy making. So the objective there was Tommy is not a scientist, but he is a policymaker and, and it was a fisherman. and a fisherman. And it's so important that the people of uh, there's uh, I talked to so many people in Palau who did not even realize that they had a trench, uh, let alone that that is an important part of their real estate that needs protection. Uh, that that's is like an important part of their economy. So so that's another another uh, take on this. Thanks, John. Um, we just have a few minutes left and we had um, a little bit ago a couple of questions related to students. Um, one being, is there anything that you would say is very important to know and learn about to teach classes on the deep sea and becoming a deep sea scientist? And another more focused on GIS, what should students who have a passion to take action in matters related to deep ocean science and GIS focus on to really make a difference? in deep sea research gaps. I think that's yours, Dawn. Well, I can speak uh, in, in terms of, of GIS because uh, we, we at ESRI have a, 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 I'm the chief scientist of ESRI and we have a, a huge initiative focused on ocean GIS and ocean exploration and ocean policy. And we're doing a lot with the UN uh, ocean decade or the mm -hmm. UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. I would say very briefly is to, to really dive into uh, the UN Ocean Decade. Uh, we produce GIS, but there's so much GIS that's being done everywhere by governments and conservation organizations. And if people want to get in touch with me uh, separately, I can, I can give you pages and pages and links and links of, of resources. Uh, but the, uh, I would say that the Ocean Decade uh, is putting out some beautiful resources there. The United Nations also has the uh, uh, IODE. Uh, IODE uh, 
ocean.org, uh, uh, which has uh, GIS and other resources uh, for, for ocean science. So, so that's, that's an easy one. I would also say to get encouraged and to see what it's like uh, for, for those of us who, have, who, who are doing this work is uh, go to uh, iwasakid.com. Uh, the, the work of Karen Romano Young and the comics that she is uh, creating uh, are doing a beautiful job of illustrating what it's like now for those of us who are in the field. And then also what it was like for us trying to get into the field, even when we were kids. So go to I was uh, I was a kid dot com, I think is uh, I, I think Karen is is on here and she can uh, correct me, put the right the right link. And there are linkages uh, with uh, Ocean Discovery League and and with um, with uh, the American Geophysical Union, with uh, with Alvin. She did all of the comics for for the Alvin certification dives. So that's another really cool resource. She just put the link in the chat. Oh, okay. Hi, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thank you, Don. Um, and there was also a question about what kinds of science and technology um, might need to be taught or studied. I don't know if either of you would like to speak to that. Maybe Don Walsh. Yeah, I am. Um, in a former life, I was uh, um, in the University, University of Southern California, where I was a professor of ocean engineering and a dean. And uh, people would come; they wanted to major in oceanography, get their biology, bachelor's in oceanography. And I said, you want my view? Yeah, okay. I said, learn the basic disciplines of undergraduate, biology, geology, chemistry, all the things that oceanographers specialize in. And I said, and then what we're trying to do in graduate school uh, is apply that, your basic disciplinary knowledge in depth, excuse the pun, uh, to uh, the ocean problems. In other words, mm -hmm. come to us with a strong disciplinary background, baccalaureate background, and then in graduate school, the I consider a master's degree uh, the entry level for an oceanographer. It's just going to take you that long, in my view, to be fully prepared to step on a ship and go to sea and do useful work. And uh, I know some universities and colleges offer a bachelor's degree in oceanography. I don't think that's worth much. I think what qualifies you to do is be a test a, a technician, you know, to assist the PhDs or the master's people, like the working oceanographers. Uh, of course, yeah, you can have an apprentice system. You come aboard with a baccalaureate degree and you go to sea a lot. And after several years, uh, you, you're going to learn by doing. But the fast track, as far as I'm concerned, is a four-year baccalaureate in uh, in one of the fundamental disciplines, and then uh, anywhere from a year to 18 months, whatever it takes, depending on how smart you are and what field you're in, to get your master's degree, and then you're an oceanographer. I, I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but I, I feel that that was the kind of advice I'd offer to students. It's not quick. No, but it's important to have that base, that foundation of knowledge before specializing. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well. Uh, it, it's still the case that the the, the fundamental disciplines are, are important, and nowadays there are so many uh, wonderful ornaments that you can put on the tree, so to speak. You've got the tree, which is the fund foundation of oceanography with the biology, chemistry, physics, geology, engineering, but uh, data science. If you want to put in some statistics and computer programming, uh, that's uh, important. Policy. Uh, resource management; uh, those are those are important ornaments uh, that that should be hung on the tree. I would say. Great, thanks, Don. I have one last very important question. I was speaking to my seven-year-old last night about talking to the two of you today, and I asked her what question she would ask you. And her question was, "What is your favorite sea creature?" Your favorite sea creature? Sea creature, yes. Huh. My wife. <laughs> I've taken her I've taken her to the Antarctic 14 times and once to the North Pole so she's not your ordinary house frau uh, and we I think that qualifies as a marine mammal yeah well she's a mammal I know that and uh, 
She. <laughs> John Wright, how about you? <laughs> My favorite sea creature is imaginary, SpongeBob. <laughs> uh -huh. <There> nice. <laughs> no, I, I, um, you know, we, I, I, as a way of seeing the world, showing, you know, I was a retired Navy type, I saw a lot of the world, but we don't take our families with us. So I, 50 years ago, I caught an opportunity to lecture on cruise ships. And we, we did it for 50 years, went all over the world. It's not perfect, but it's a way to get out on the sea. So we spent probably over a year total, uh, and it's the equivalent of two-week cruises, maybe longer than that. Uh, and I just retired from my last cruise, and we have seen the whole world. As I said, I, I took her to the North Pole on a Russian nuclear icebreaker. That was a special kind of sea time. I've taken it, as I said, down the Antarctic, but of course, you have to get from South America to uh, across the Drake Strait, Cape Horn, all that to get to the Antarctic. So there's there's a hidden truth in my favorite marine mammal. My, my, my Definitely a great way to get around. Um, yeah. And in fact, some cruise companies um, like Lindblad Expeditions are making berths available on their vessels for scientists to come on board. Yeah. Um, that particular one has a call for proposals out right now. So if you're interested, uh, give us a shout and we can give you information about that. Um, also, uh, yeah. Katie, um, artists and uh, and uh, writers, journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, NSF is actually paying uh, a stipend for people that are in the arts and in journalism or, or authors to actually sample some extreme environments such as the Antarctic. So you don't have to be a scientist uh, to have that opportunity to see some of these wonderful places on our planet. That is true. I, I've, I've done time. 80 expeditions to uh, the polar regions. Most of them were like the Lindblad, their uh, staff member for uh, uh, tourist trips, uh, talking about penguins and things like that. But I, I did a few in the early days as an actual member of the research team. I've run out of gas. <laughs> well, it's right at the top of the hour, so it's a perfect time to run out of gas. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being here today. Um, and in addition to today being January 23rd, anniversary of the big event, it's also the day that Don Walsh would be honored at the Explorers Club for his achievement and um, continued contributions to oceanography and ocean exploration. So congratulations to you, Don. Mm -hmm. Um, and thank you, Don Wright, for being here and sharing your story and experience. It has really been a pleasure. So thank you, everyone, for being here, and we'll see you again soon.